Good morning, everybody. Greetings. Let's make sure this is all working properly. How's everybody doing? Thanks for being here. Hope everyone's starting their May off on a wonderful note. Um, yeah. Episode seven. It's, we're moving right along. Colorado. Um, happy to be doing this state. Um, kind of cor correlates here perfectly with Utah. Um, I'm probably going to skip the vote this week and do New Mexico and just finish off the four corner states. Um, they have so many similarities as well as so many differences. And um, so I think I'm just going to have to do that one next. And then the following week we'll be voting for Idaho or Nevada. You know, that's loosely termed. We'll see what happens, but I think that's what I'm going to go with. So New Mexico, expect New Mexico for next week. Um, I'm considering maybe just doing two of these a month, doing one every two weeks. Um, I have so much information. I'm having a, kind of a difficult time filtering it all and trying to touch on everything is really difficult. Like I said, I've been trying to get these to 90 minutes, you know, the average person out there watching. If they make it past 30 minutes, it's a miracle. So, you know, doing a two-hour show, um, you know, just doesn't make sense. You know, that's a lot of time. So um, I might be spreading it out and doing smaller videos as I lead up to the main episode. I'm not quite sure, the, sure yet, but I just wanted you guys to know, um, you know, leave a comment. Um, but how I'm feeling about it. You know, I'm just kind of breezing through all these, and uh, every time I finish editing or go back through my material, I'm like, oh, man, I've missed so much. And that's the case. I uh, really felt that way with Utah. I've really felt that way with California. Um, I'll be doing some more smaller segment stuff. People really seem to love those, so I'll be splitting up these longer videos into really short uh, videos, kind of clip by clip, article by article, so... Um, people could just see, you know, things that interest them or stand out. Um, but yeah, if you haven't seen, um, I posted a little preview to a new series I'm considering starting um, on Radium. That's on my channel. It came out yesterday. Um, everyone really seems to like it. So that's definitely going to be something I pursue. My plan is to release the, the, that ep an episode for that um, once a week. And those are going to be really short. They're going to be like one or two articles and then my opinions on them and how they kind of fit into the grand scheme of things. Um, every one of, not everyone, many of my West Coast articles contain something about radium. And as we work our way, you know, into Idaho and Wyoming and the Badlands and so forth, you know, radium is still going to be very popular. These, these desolate lands that were smited by the gods. Um, radium is a big part of that. And that has to do with, you know, um, you know, these events, these cataclysmic events, um, the destruction of organic matter, organic beings, trees, titans, many things. 13th monkey. Glad to see you here. Stellium, Brett, Joe, Jillian, Robert, all you guys that I see in here regularly appreciate you. Um, you know, Stellium. Um, you know, I'll be talking about, um, Stellium a little bit in this episode. I'll be talking about Hangman 11, was it 118? I can't remember exactly what the number is, but Hangman's material. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about petrifactions in this video. Remember, petrifactions go hand in hand with radium. Um, all of the petrified forests of Arizona, Oregon, Utah, especially Colorado, um, they found that every one of these petrified trees contain radium in a pretty high amount. You know, radium is very, very minuscule per ton. And when you find, you know, high amounts of it, it's still a tiny fraction, you know, 
thousands and thousands of tons of pitch to make, you know, one gram. I mean, that's not even actually true. It's actually much more than that. But, um, yeah, so the radium, you know, radium is basically, you know, like little balls of light, like little ball, like little suns. And I think it's contained in the living matter of you know, unorganic trees and, and, uh, living beings. Um, yeah. And there's no greater supply of it than Colorado. Um, Colorado, um, before Colorado's giant radium mines were understood and, um, you know, capitalized on the most of the radium in the world was coming from Bohemia. And, um, all of the European experiments were coming from Bohemian radium and they were exhausting that rather quickly. And it was quite difficult to get. And there were very, very, very tight control on, on who was, who was manufacturing it. There It was controlled by the Germans. And, um, you'll find that they, the, those same, that same group found their way over here and, and we're, we're up to the same dirty tricks. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a synopsis. So if you haven't seen the radium show, please check it out. It's just a quick little, I think 10, 10, 12 minute, uh, video on an article that I've been holding on to for a very long time. Um, if you watched my interview with Greg on THC, we talked about it just a little bit, but not in that great depth, but this is a fantastic article because it's the first time radium's written about believe it or not, in an American newspaper. And it's one of the most, you know, juicy, um, interesting explanations of of the type of anti-gravitic um, propulsion that was being used in the 1800s. And yeah, they, did, they discussed apergee, which will be probably the focus of the next video. We're going to get into... Um, the Astor family, John Jacob Astor, and I've hypothesized for a long time what was really the main purpose about uh, the Titanic. I mean, it was multifaceted, but Astor was a big player there. Um, he was also trying to get control of radium uh, for his own purposes. And uh, he wrote some amazing material about traveling in anti gravitic based ships to other planets. Hey, this guy was, this guy, there's a lot of stuff people don't know about this guy. And hopefully we'll, we'll get into that. We'll talk about Apergee, um, what that really means or what at least they said it meant. <clears throat> and yeah, so I'm kind of getting off base here. <clears throat> but yeah, so let's get, uh, let's get this Colorado show rolling. Um. <sighs> If you remember in the Utah show, and if you haven't seen the Utah show, please check it out. Uh, episode six, uh, we discussed <clears throat> we discussed the, the <clears throat> we discussed the Shriners, um, the Shriners of Denver, <clears throat> making their pilgrimage once a year to the Grand Temple of Salt Lake City, and the the the, the these Shriners would ride camels through the desert all the way to Salt Lake from, you know, from Denver. And, um, so I'll share my screen really quick here. And, uh, there's a lot of material to cover today. Obviously I'm not going to get to it all. And that's not what I wanted. Where here he is. So, again, for those of you who don't know, um, I put everything into kind of a um, condensed version. So, again, you don't need a Twitter account. And my information, hopefully some of my mods will post uh, the thread here or my account. You don't need an account. You can just view it. You can expect every week. Um to go back through and it's going to be kind of a, just a quick little uh, overview of some of the things I'm going to talk about. There's a lot of other stuff that's not on here, just stuff that kind of comes to my mind that I just didn't post or feel like posting or, you know, ran out of time. Time is a thing I don't have a lot of. So, but this is a, a great feature. If there's something that I touch on lightly that you want to go back and look at, you know, maybe explore more for yourself. 
this is the best way to do it. So it's a cool little layout that's accessible to everybody. Um, yeah. So don't, don't forget that. Um, but yeah. So again, we were talking about, we'll just do a quick little look at these pictures of Denver. I just love this one. It's just incredible. Um, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger without getting all the stupid extra Twitter shit. There we go. Incredible city, Denver. Um, all the main huge houses here are in this front foyer in the front here. may not be that easy to see. I apologize again why you should just go to the Twitter and you can maximize the image. You know, Denver was a city comp completely built of stone and brick. There was literally not a house of barely any houses made of wood. Um, and all these homes here are gigantic. This front park here. You can see the Capitol building here. A monster. Three and a half stories below ground. Um, you know, and the Rockies in the background. Um, I've had the privilege to be on the ground in Denver several, several times. Um, incredibly beautiful place. Um, when you land there, it's just like, you feel like you're literally landing inside the middle of a mountain range, which you pretty much are. And, uh, you know, since we're talking about radium so often, um, they talked about um, the air in, radi in Denver being incredibly pure and that the higher altitudes um, create better health. And it's kind of a weird contradiction, right? Lower oxygen should be worse for you. Um, they also studied the air in the 1920s and found that the radium, there was radium in the air. Very interesting. Um, people with rheumatism and all these other, um, you know, breathing and um, inflammation found a lot of relief here, which is rare. You know, colder climates, higher altitudes, drier air. But they found they found that the air was fairly humid here. Kind of strange and charged with radium. Of course, you know. Denver is the radium capital of the world, essentially. We'll get into that. Here's an old map of Denver, 1908. <clears throat> Pretty incredible. Again, you can um, look at these yourself and zoom in on some of these old buildings. But, I mean, this is 1908. I mean, there aren't many cities as populated as Denver in 1908. It's quite insane. I never really realized. You know, you think Denver was pretty small. But um, you look at pictures of some California cities. The I would say Denver was one of the biggest cities on the West Coast. You know, West Coast, loosely speaking, <clears throat> west of the Mississippi. But yeah, it's a monster. Um, here's another one. This is 1887, I believe. 1888, something around there. But you can see these buildings. None of these survived. Even that 1908, there's just two of these left. Again, I apologize for the not being able to see these very well, but this is, again, why you should be able to, to uh, go to the account and go look at these yourself. But just look at some of these buildings, you guys. They're giants. 100-plus room buildings. Giants. Stone. Several floors underground. And by 1908, they're gone. Very strange. You'll find that that's kind of an overlapping thing here. Here's 1887. So that one was 1888. Again, you can see the Capitol building that was still there in 1908, but all the rest of these are gone for the most part. Just big old monsters. Yeah. Um, and since we were talking about the Shriners, right? The Shriners who were taking the pilgrimage to Utah. Um, really important. You know, we talked about all the very strange and undeniable overlays, biblical overlays. You know, Deut Deuteronomy is almost a direct mirror, um, you know, to Moses crossing the Red Sea of California and ending up in Moab and standing on Mount Nebo gazing at the entire open plain. Um, you know, similar to Utah as well, 
um, Colorado was known as the Ophir, you know, the mining regions of Solomon. And there are just too many undeniable overlays. The oldest mines in the in the world. Remember, in the in the 1800s, I don't want to say remember. Um, maybe I'll do another whole episode just on mining. But when they were exploring the mines here in America in the 1800s, you know, we talk about the Phoenicians in in Michigan. They were finding mines that were hundreds of miles long in the Dakotas, Wyoming. Um, so this place was mined long before the Spaniards. I mean, even the Spaniards talk about all the gold that existed in the Americas. I mean, that was probably their driving force. I think it was a lot more than that. But, you know, they use terms like the Garden of Eden and the land of Ophir and the mines of Solomon, and many, many things. And they're discussing these areas. And so here's the temple the El Jebel Temple of Denver. Um, and I think it's directly correlated to what we were discussing with the, the pilgrimage stuff and why that's so important. And probably one of the real driving forces to the repopulating of America and why it's incredibly hard to find anything pre-1840 um, about this they're just you know even though obviously you had some 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 native americans some ad- aboriginal tribes um if you've been following me along through this series you'll know that from alaska all the way to episode seven here in colorado we're dealing with quote native americans or aboriginal peoples that are standing on top of ruins that they don't know anything about they say their forefathers have no idea that five grandfathers, six grandfathers, 10 grandfathers before them, the ruins were there. These things have been here for a very long time. And, you know, quote, God smited the land and no place shows that more here than than west of the Mississippi. You know, lava flows here in Colorado were upwards of a thousand feet. You know, we were dealing with, we were dealing with 400 feet in Oregon. We were dealing with almost a thousand in parts of Washington. We were dealing with four to 600 feet lava flows in California. And here on the Western slopes of the Rockies, we're dealing with numbers very similar to that, a thousand feet or more. And if you'll remember, they were finding beaches in, in Washington below a thousand feet of lava flow a beach, sand, gravel, shells, what happened? Same thing in Oregon, California, they found entire stone cities under 400 feet of lava. So, yeah, we're dealing with, you know, a, a, an epoch of America that was utterly destroyed. And I just uh, wanted to cover that because it related directly to our Utah episode. The last one, again, if you haven't checked that out, you should. I did a quick little edit um, video. If you just want to get a synopsis of the pilgrimage to Salt Lake, you can find that on my channel. It's about 10 minutes, I think. It's a, it's a great little one. It's kind of a little overview of what I was just mentioning there and why Salt Lake is um, a perfect mirror to Deuteronomy and that the biblical lands are here in Utah. Um, I'm going to start here with the Garden of the Gods. We're going to transition into some um, talking a little bit about Hangman's work. Um, you know, Stellium fits into this nicely. Uh, me and him have been talking about petrif- the petrification of the, the earth for many years. And I would say, <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit about Ezekiel here as well, Ezekiel 3.1. And why I think that the Garden of the Gods of Ezekiel is the Garden of the Gods of Colorado. And when you look at these images, I'm going to show you here. These are the the earliest color images of the Garden of the Gods that I could find. Early, early 1900s. Some of them late 1800s. Um, Yeah, so I've rambled enough. We're 20 minutes in. 86 people here. Appreciate all of you guys. You know, I'm I'm the worst at looking at chat. So if you have a question, 
I will try to uh, I will try to get to it. Uh, thank you, man. You just confirmed a possible underground pyramid no one has found yet. There are pyramids all over this area. Basalt pyramids or basalt. So part one of the articles I didn't get to in Washington was they had found basalt pyramids. They found an underground cave. Underground cave. That's a silly phrase. They found an underground ocean in a cave. And at the beach or the water side of the of this ocean, they found two petrified ships. And they um, got a canoe or a kayak or whatever, a little ship, little boat down on this water, and they paddled for hours and hours. And sometimes they couldn't even see other the opposite ends of the wall. And they just they were on a vast ocean where their lanterns wouldn't even. They were just floating in a, in a dark abyss. The light wouldn't even touch the walls. Anyways, long story short, after exploring this cave, they came out and they explored the area around it, and they found basalt pyramids man-made man-hewn basalt and you know basalt is incredibly incredibly hard stone um same thing on the colorado river um i didn't get to all those articles in my arizona episode or my utah episode there are pyramids in utah there are pyramids in arizona basalt pyramids you know it's incredibly hard to shape and if you remember in my california episode we talked about um an egyptian city they found um east of san diego the day's march you know, not far with seven pyramids. So yeah, the pyramids of the Americas are far older than Egypt. This goes along with the mummies and you know, we covered a lot of that in Utah. The oldest mummies ever found um, are in the Americas. You know, I, I would, they say Peruvian, but when you look into it, that a lot of the mummies in America were stolen. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that here too, going forward. So yeah, the garden of the gods here's the image that it made and you'll see why in a second so i type in um for those of you new that are new here i type in a little excerpt from the clip or from the clipping and i run it through ai and it makes me an image and you'll see why in a second here's one of those color images um, when i finish this article we're going to read through ezekiel 3 1 and and see some overlays there <clears throat> The Garden of the Gods. <clears throat> in the nestling vows and on the grassy plains which lie at the foot of the great white mountain that point the way to heaven live the chosen people. Now remember these words again because they correlate nicely with what we were discussing with Deuteronomy and Utah. And as we go into Ezekiel here, it'll you know it's important important part to remember. Here they dwelled in happiness together. And above them on the summit of the mighty peak, where stands the western gates to heaven, dwelt the Manitou. Now we're going to cover what that is. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but it's a very important word, the Manitou. In order that the chosen people might know of his love, the Manitou stamped upon the peak the image of his face, that all might see and worship him. And there each day the chosen people came to pray and worship where the first bright rays of the rising sun embossed the image in their golden glow. There in happiness they dwelt, the realm extending just as far as they might see the face of Manitou over hill and plain. And the land was fair, and the chosen tribe was invited by all the dwellers of the plains who knew not Manitou. But one day, as the storm clouds played about the peak, the image of the Manitou was hid. Low-hanging clouds swept down from the sky and crept to the earth in mist and fog and rain, and the happy, smiling face of the Manitou was hid, and none could see it. And down from the north swept a barbaric host of giants, taller than the spruce which grew upon the mountainside, and so great that they shook the earth with their strides. With the invading hosts came terrible beasts, unknown and awful in their mightiness, monstrous beasts that would devour the earth and tread it down. And as they came on, the chosen people were frightened, 
and in their fear they fled to the holy mount. For in the sight of their titanic foes, they were grasshoppers. As the invading tribes came on, the chosen people fell on their faces and prayed to Manitou for aid. Then came to pass a wondrous miracle. The clouds broke away, and sunshine smote the peak. And from the very summit, looking down upon the valley and the plains, appeared the Manitou himself. Sternly he looked upon the invaders, and as he looked, the giants and the beast turned to stone. As then they stood, the giants stand today. Their scattered bands, now rock of red and brown, are found to east and north, time-worn and scarred, with legs deep buried in the drifting sand. Some bolder than the rest are near the mount, and some are far away in sheltered canyons, as if they sought to hide. Some hold their shields uplifted as if to meet the stony gaze of the Manitou, while others crouched in horror, were struck dumb and turned to stone where they were, where they stood. The beasts and the giants drove are strangers still. Big, clumsy elephants with clumsy trunks, camels and massive bears and timid deer, smooth, glossy beaver with flat, scaly tails, huge frogs, timid turtles, all were changed and stand today as they stood when, living, they defied the Manitou. They covered all the valley, these living men and beasts now turned to stone. And if you doubt this story and go and see them standing there today as they stood then, time-worn and gray, are from countless storms, half buried in sweeping sands, and yet if you look closely you can see their forms. The giants and the beasts that hoped to steal the land, there dwelt the tribesmen who were our fathers. When the white men came, they called the spot the Garden of the Gods, because they say the rocks are great and old. But we who know the story of the race still call it the Valley of the Miracle. For here it was that Manitou gave aid to save his chosen people and left there these rocks and forms of men, all turned to stone, as warning to all of us who may sometime attempt defiance to him and his commands. So yeah, the Garden of the Gods, the land of giants, frozen in time, petrified. Here's a little excerpt that I had clipped many, many years ago when I was doing work on um, Black Panther and showing people what that sh movie was about. Um, just to kind of, I think it's important to talk about here. There's without a doubt, I should say, much that is unprecedented in the behavior of Wakanda or Manitou or Mana. And in any case, the means used to bring into play the mysterious power does not indicate the apprehension of a definite and stable quantitative relationship between this means. The power... So basically what this guy is going on to say is that when you look at the terms that these different tribes are using, this, the Sayu, the Iroquois, the Melanesian, um, they're talking about some magnetic event. Um, plasma is, is what I like to say. Um, when you study mana from a biblical standpoint or even from you know more of a mystical standpoint, standpoint that some of these uh, native tribes used to describe it for me it's a li it's living energy and for me that's plasma so this event that these people the chosen people again look at all the biblical overlays they're discussing here these these so these quote chosen people were saved by their god imprinted on a mountain of stone using i, I would say when they talk about his gaze it's like medusa it's a plasma um, event. And whether or not these were really living giants, like, you know, foot in hand and, and running and chasing, um, I, I tend to lean towards that the, they're describing perhaps an event where, where titans were petrified through some event. Um, 
but the garden of the gods um, is a direct relation to Ezekiel. And yeah, so we're going to read a little bit from Ezekiel here. And yeah, so Ezekiel 3.1. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now remember what we've been talking about, too. Um, I've been showing pretty unmistakable um, evidences. I don't want to say proofs, but evidence. Um, to shed new light on what Egypt really was and what the time frames may have looked like. And the oldest mummies from Arizona and Utah are far older than the mummies of the Nile. And the pyramids here that no longer exist and have been destroyed by the hands of man were far older than the pyramids of Giza. So who, what pharaoh are we talking about here? I, I would go as far as to say, you know, if you remember my Egyptian city that the miners stumbled into in Arizona, this would be a direct correlation to what I mentioned loosely, but haven't really done a, a presentation on when we talk about the damming of, you know, the Hoover Dam and some of these other major rivers that they were flooding a lot of ancient cities. And there's a lot of material all across America, Canada, Mexico, of this very same thing. And maybe someday I'll sit down and I'll cover kind of a synopsis and go over a few different representations. But um, yeah, they they were... They were people from the Smithsonian, you know, who are responsible for a lot of things, um, unfortunately, leaving the public, spec the public sphere, um, talking about that they had, were in this huge rush to clear out all these things. Anyways, son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, whom art thou, like in thy greatness? Behold, behold, important here, behold, the Assyrian was a cedar. In Lebanon. Now, the cedars of Lebanon are the cedars of the southwest. All of these ancient ruins now that I've been speaking of, Utah, Arizona, almost all of them, these are cities so large, millions dwelt there, millions, millions. Cities that were miles and miles long, 10 miles wide, 40 miles long. Um, they were using cedar. Almost all of the homes that that weren't completely 100% built, built of stone or adobe, but most of the adobe homes had cedar roofs. And the really, really, really big ones, the ones that were they, that are far more advanced than the adobe that we're talking about, you know, in the 1700s adobe, we're talking about, you know, adobe blocks that are, that are made by giants because they're so huge that, you know, these five foot, four foot tall um, Indians quote, Indians, Native Americans, couldn't have built these. And and many of them go four or five stories below ground, as we've talked about. But anyways, behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature. And his top was among the thick bows. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high and her rivers running round about his plants sent her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. We're talking about a giant tree that is like, you know, creating an ecosystem below it. This is like the vapor canopy. You've heard me loosely mention this uh, idea before. I've talked a lot about Avatar as a real representation of what perhaps our world was like long before. Um, that we were dealing with very large trees so tall that they created a, a ecosystem within them and then below them, similar to the way that, you know, when you look at a rainforest, 90% of all life lives in and on the tree, in, on, and around the tree, 90%. And in a dense rainforest, they, they, they create what's called a vapor canopy, where the ecosystem below it and above it are completely different. This is what I think it was like um before the flood before this event that they're highlighting here before this plasma event where things were turned to stone and giant and giants and titans as big as mountains were frozen in place i think this is that this is the kind of um world i'm picturing and the biblical stuff was you know um really seems to represent that for me 
And I hope you're kind of seeing that as we go through some of this stuff. <clears throat> Therefore, his height was exalted above all the trees of the field. And his boughs were multiplied and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. All the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young. And under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Now, um, for those who haven't seen some of my work with Dr. Longo, we talk about this the cypress tree. And I talked about that during hurricanes, um, you'll get all these animals, animals that normally hunt each other and kill each other. All these animals will will gravitate and fill up the cypress tree. You know, cypress trees are hollow for a, you know, about, you know, a few feet up. And then for a very, depending on the size, there's a huge hollow cavity inside of them. And that during a hurricane, the animals retreat within the trees. And I've hypothesized, you know, with some of the cypress trees that they were cutting down in Florida in the 1700s, 1800s, um, and that they were just twigs of the large mother tree or many of these trees as this, as this, um, Biblical references here is talking is that we had the Assyrian was a cedar so large that all of the, basically they're talking about all the life lived below it and within it. And then it was like the protector, right? The multitudes. Um, yeah, that, that kind of avatar representation, I think is one of the best. And that was kind of what the world was like. Mm, you know, we had um, the whole world was tropical. These trees created one, one type of ecosystem, not one type of ecosystem, I'm sorry, one particular type of weather I, would be a better representation. And from Alaska, as I covered in my Alaska video, all the way here in Colorado, we're going to get into some of the coral um, sea life that they found here in Colorado, that the there were islands of trees. Trees made these large ecosystems all over the world, and that the water levels were a lot higher. And the whole world was tropical and everyone lived in perpetual light, you know, perhaps the purpley haze that people talk about. I'm not sure on the color, but there was continual light. No one knew of the sun or the moon. They didn't exist. This was before that time. And yeah, so let's get back into this. Where was I? In the shadows dwell. So in, under his shadow dwelt all great nations that this, this mother tree. Um, everyone resided below it. Thus we he thus was he fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. Um, when you look at certain um, mountain structures, you know, Paradise Falls comes to mind and a few others that look like tree, tree roots that have been cut perfectly flat. Um, you'll often see waterfalls coming from them. And when you look into some of these um, structures, you find that there's not enough water flowing on top of the structure to, to designate these waterfalls. And, you know, there's waterfalls that come out of the side of some of these cliffs. And I, I've hypothesized, hypothesized that these are, these are remnants of the, the, the water veins of a tree. You know, a tree has these large veins for sap, which is like their blood, you know, causes cavitation and draws the water up into the higher parts of the tree. Um, and that these veins flow like rivers and that a lot of the cave systems of America and the world are composed a lot primarily of, of, of these, um, these kind of blood vessels, these sap vessels or water vessels, um, from old trees. Yeah. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs and the chestnut trees were not like his branches nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by his by the multiple to, multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God in, envied him. So here we go. An important reference here and why I believe, similar to the things we've been talking about with Utah, that even though the narrative is that these names were given in the late 1800s, these names existed far before. It was the Valley of Mystery in the Garden of God, right? And just looking at some of these pictures here, and we'll get into a little bit better 
uh, resolution. I just love this one. You know, just you're just taking a little stroll. Yeah, just an amazing place. Uh, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted my lifted up thyself in height, and he hath shot up his top among the thick bows, and his heart is lifted up as high. I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of Heb- of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off and have left him upon the mountains and in all the valleys his branches are fallen and his boughs are broken by the rivers of the land and all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. So that's kind of like the event, I think, that they're discussing here, right? Um, there was some event. Plasma is is what I'm leaning towards. Um you find this, you know, the the same description of plasma among a lot of these people. And, um, you know, the Electrical Universe um, documentary is fantastic. You can kind of explore some of these petroglyphs and hieroglyphs that show a story that's kind of relating to this same narrative. And, um, yeah, so loosely I'll hop over here and I'll just uh, hangman1128. If you aren't familiar, you should be. Um, he has a video on the Garden of the Gods and the Assyrians, and he has a very similar opinion to me. Um, I would say even far more advanced in the fact that he has, you know, boots on the ground and is showing um, what I'm, what I've been saying for a very long time. And if Stellium's still in here, um, him as well, um, that there was some event or several events that. Um, turned the world to stone, petrified the whole world. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend this video here, Garden of the Gods and the Assyrian. And he goes through this this uh, this area and shows pretty much, pretty definitely that um, we're dealing with petrified wood. And these articles that I often cover, they strongly support that same narrative. Um, petrifactions are everywhere. And since we're on it here, just look at this, you guys, okay? This is a conical hill 500 feet tall. And similar to what we've talked about in Utah and Arizona, when they found conical hills like this, they started digging in them and they found giant buildings. Almost all the mounds, mounds as they call them, Foot, foothills even, but conical especially, are buried cities. And I've, I have one or two or three articles specifically on this in, in my last two or three series. So there's plenty of material if you want to go back. I strongly recommend that you do. So yeah, this is an image of a buried city, without a doubt. Underneath this is basically how they describe when they break through these layers it's a sandy um sandstone that's often filled with different types of 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 seashell and, and things of that sort and it doesn't take long and i should have had a, um, some of my other um clips but you can go back and watch in utah and arizona we talk about this a lot um but yeah buried under the under the mounds are buried cities um so yeah we're leaving the garden of the gods remember um named that directly from in my opinion ezekiel um and describing it in an event where you know perhaps one of many of these giant cedars was was cut down by some event um i want to kind of keep it relevant here yeah, we'll do this one. I think this is the one. Yeah, so this this um, structure we're going to get into um, had gigantic cedar beams. Ancient Colorado. There has been recently discovered in the fertile valley of the Animas in southern west, southwestern Colorado, the ancient ruins of a once extensive and populous city, indicating the present centuries ago of a highly cultured and enlightened race of people. 
The ruins of the houses, corrals, towns, fortifications, ditches, pottery ware, drawings, non-interpretal non writings, etc., show that many arts were cultivated by these prehistoric people, which are now entirely lost. Their houses are built of most every kind of stone, from small boulders to the finest sandstone. This valley has been covered with buildings of every size, the two largest being 300 feet by 6,000 feet. Let me repeat that. The valley has been covered with buildings of every size, the two largest being 300 feet by 6,000 feet. This is a building that's over a mile long. Unbelievable. That sounds crazy, but if you've watched enough of my videos, they, they, there, was a, there, was a, there was a metropolis found in Utah that was four miles long. One consecutive construction that was four miles long. They are built of small blocks of sandstone laid in adobe mud. The outside wall being four feet. Four feet. And the inside wall from a foot and a half to three feet. So two walls. This, this, this 6,000 foot long building has two walls. One's four feet thick. One's three feet thick. I mean, the amount of people to build this is unbelievable. It's, you know, again, like I was saying, we're dealing with a population of an, un, I mean, approaching millions. It has to. You know, when we talked about the canal structures in Arizona, um, you know, not even in the 1900s, we're just talking the late 1800s, they had already estimated a thousand miles of canals. And these canals were incredible. They weren't just dug ditches. They were they were st cobblestone terracotta canals that they still use today. Okay. The, where are the biblical lands? It's seeming like the desolate South American Southwest was a prime location. In the lower story are found portholes at foot square. No signs of a door are visible in the outer walls, and the ingress must have been from the top. In the inside, there being passages from room to room, most of them are small. Okay, so what they're describing here, I know that's kind of hard to understand, but this correlates again with the Utah stuff. Um, we're dealing with entrances that are buried below ground. They're saying that there are no doorways. Where are the doorways? They're inside the building. Well, that's the the main entrances are on the bottom floor, and the bottom floor is sometimes four stories below ground. In the lower story are found portholes in the lower story. No signs of a door are visible in the outer walls. Right. The outer walls of, of ground level to these explorers is not ground level when this structure was built. I'll guarantee you that. All right, back to where we're. most of them are small from eight by 10 by 12 by 14 feet. The doors being two by four feet. The arches over the doors and the portholes are made of a small of small cedar poles, two inches wide placed across. Now, again, that doesn't seem like much, but can you imagine how much cedar went into building a structure this big? Okay, it's, and remember, it says that the two the two largest buildings are 300 by 6,000. So that's two buildings. They're 300 feet apart. And there's two of them that are over a mile long with walls four feet and three feet thick and cedar poles holding up the roof. So, I mean, I don't even know. Hundreds of thousands of cedar poles were cut for this structure. Not to mention millions and millions of bricks. Placed across. Okay. Masonry was placed on top of the cedar roof. See the sleepers supporting the floors are of cedar. Again, same thing. So not only is the roof, but all the joists going under each of the floors are cedar. About eight inches thick. That's not small, you guys. And from 20 to 50 feet long. Okay. So 20 to 50 feet long eight inches thick, and there's probably 
a hundred thousand of these for this giant structure. I don't even know. I can't even estimate. Uh, a layer of small round poles was then placed across the sleepers, and then a layer of thinly split cedar sticks, then about three inches of earth, then a layer of cedar bark, then another layer of dirt, then a carpet of some kind. So this is they're talking about the thatchings and the type of roof structure, okay? Cedar on cedar on cedar on cedar on cedar, tons of cedar. And then for two structures that run horizontally to each other that are 300 feet apart, that are 6,000 feet long, four feet thick walls, that's the outer wall. So there's an outer wall that goes along this structure. And then the walls of the structure are three feet thick. Then another layer, yep, the rooms that have been protected from exposure are, exposure are whitewashed. So all of the places that are exposed to the elements are plastered. This is exactly like we were talking about in Utah and in Arizona, um, a type of plaster that they didn't even know existed. And then they all of the plastered walls were painted with all these different beautiful images and, and um, showing, you know, um, animals and warriors and all these different things. The walls are ornamented with drawings and writings, just like Utah and Arizona. In one of these rooms, the impression of a hand dipped in whitewash on a joist is as plain as if it had been done yesterday. In another room, there are drawings of tarantulas, centipedes, horses, and men. In some of the rooms have been found human bones, bones of sheep, corn cobs. Really important. Remember that because we're going to get into the corn cobs. Raw hides and all colors and varieties of pottery ware. These two large buildings are exactly the same in every respect. Okay, so like they were saying, the two buildings that are a mile plus long, that are 300 feet apart, are identical to one another. Portions of the buildings plainly show they were destroyed by fire. The timbers being burned off and the roofs caved in leaving the lower rooms entirely protected. Old ditches and roads are to be seen in every direction, canals and roads. The Navajo Indians say in regard to these ruins that their forefathers came there five old men ages ago, 500 years, and that these ruins were there, and the same then as now, and there is no record whatever of their origin. So yeah, I would in you know 500 years. This is this article is the 1800s. So you know, before the Spaniards, of course, and even the Spaniards talk about ruins in these areas. So, but yeah, I wanted to kind of start there to just to help your mind's eye see. Again, we're dealing with the same type of unbelievably gargantuan structures. You know, we're not dealing with these. You know, when you visit, you know, and I've been to Arizona, I've been to Utah, I've been to Colorado, I've seen these adobe places. They're tiny little places with like four or five rooms that the rooms, you know, I'm six, four. I can't fit in any of this stuff. But these bigger places that, that you never hear of, unless you dig into these articles, you know, are gargantuan, you know, nothing even like that, you know, nothing like these cliff, the cliff dweller homes. And the thing about the cliff, cliff dweller homes that I wanted to really make a point of too, is that those are just, those are like, think of those as defenses. Some of them, there were rooms, but they were like labyrinths. So I described that those cliff dweller houses that, as they call them, that they were just, that was like a vaulted door because all of them go into the mountain. All of these places go inside of these mountains. And I would go as far as to say that most of these sandstone places are remnants of trees. When you look into trees petrifying, you know, sandstone, sand, all of the coal, so much of these different layers are existing in the tree when it petrifies. And they're very pliable. And remember, they found miles and miles and miles and miles of tunnels, endless tunnels behind some of these cliff dwelling homes. So I just think these are vaulted doors. They describe how when you get in them, you have to go around, you know, these turns and there's these, all these, you have to go through these tiny little holes. And, you know, these people were making defensive entryways to their underground subterranean cities. Where do we go from there? Um, should we do some more structure stuff? 
Oh, well, we talked about corn, so maybe we'll we'll talk about corn. A subterranean lake. Colorado has a subterranean lake. Okay, listen. This is a lake below ground. Okay, in a in a cave. I apologize for the the poor quality on the clip, but this one's from a long, long time ago. I clipped this one years and years ago. Colorado has a subterranean lake of considerable extent, covered with soil about 18 inches thick. On the soil is cultivated a field of corn, which produces 30 bushels to the acre. The ground is black marl in nature, and in all probability, the lake was once an open body of water on which accumulated vegetable matter, which has been increasing over time, from time to time, until now it has a crust sufficiently strong and rich to produce fine corn. Imagine this. Imagine going in a cave and seeing a, a, a lake covered in, in 18 inches of, of vegetable matter with huge rows of corn growing on it. While harvesting, the hands catch great strings of fish by making a hole through the earth. A person rising on his heels, a person on this 18 inches of vegetable matter, right? They rise up on their heels and come down suddenly, can see the growing corn shake, you know, rolls like, you know, around him. And having sufficient strength to drive a rail through the crust will find on releasing it that it will disappear altogether. Crazy. This is like biodynamics times a thousand. You got fish, you know, you got the roots growing, growing through this vegetable matter into the lake. You got all the fish eating the, the, you know, think of the nitrates and think of the ecosystem here, you know? Hydroponics, yeah. Hydrodynamic hydroponics, 100%. <clears throat> so, and then there's one more corn one that I want to touch on that I've mentioned before. And I don't think I put it in this clipping. Okay, I have to find it. So give me one second. It's really important. Bum, 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 bum. I should probably see how everyone's doing. 126 people here. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I get in the zone and I, you know, you know how bad I am at uh, at uh, looking at chat. So I'm looking up um, an article about a gentleman who found porn. Here we go. Okay. So we're hopping over from the subterranean corn, right? That we just read. Cave underground, lake of corn. A corn experiment. Fresh seed corn is at a discount in the Northwest since a certain Chicago man tried his hand at raising the cereal. His seed was several hundred years old and his crop is the marvel of the neighborhood. Two years ago, while he was investigating the Indian mounds of Colorado and studying the customs of the ancient red man, as evidenced by the relics which they had left behind, he came upon a sealed jar in the interior of one of the mounds. Upon opening it, he found it contained kernels of Indian corn, evidently in good condition, although discolored from age. More from curiosity than anything else, he planted some of the corn. Upon his return, to his own astonishment, as well as to the astonishment of everyone else who knew of the experiment, nearly every kernel sprouted and grew. Not only that, but it grew to an unusual size. The height of the stalks measuring 12 feet, many of the ears being as long as a man's forearm. This would indicate that the Indians knew a thing or two about agriculture before we began sending them to college. The Chicago man harvested his crop with great, with great care and generously distributed a part of it among his friends, who in turn planted their seed the next spring. One of the possessors of John S. Dodge of the Washington Crosby Milling Company, his crop did equally well, and he in turn divided the precious kernels. 
the corn has naturally created much interest on the part of those who have known its ancient origin, and there is a demand for the specimen kernels to plant. As each kernel of succeeding crop is carefully hoarded, it will not be many seasons before there will be enough for a large number of curious experiments. So I mentioned the wheat of Ophir. They found wheat and all kinds of different seeds in mummies. Um, not in mummies, sorry. With mummies. Um, they found some in California. And if you remember my Arizona article, they found mummy wheat in Arizona. Um, they planted this mummy wheat. So here's a picture of the guy. Okay. The seeds he took back home with him to Illinois. The gentleman is almost six foot. So, and the ears of corn, like I said, are as big as his forearm. Anyone that's seen an ear of corn that big, unbelievable. I've never seen one that big, and I've never, ever seen corn this tall. And we talked about um, with the with the mummy wheat that they had a very similar experience. The wheat grew, I think there was like four times the yield per acre, four times. And that's very similar to this. The, the 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 harvest was almost double and with corn that's unheard of and you know ears of you know the ears being you know 12 14 15 inches it's, we're dealing with a col a, a culture that you know when we talk about the irrigation and the type of canal work in arizona and then you're finding you know um this was part of my correlation with the um the land of solomon you know and the, the fear of solomon and solomon's temple being surrounded by fields of wheat and so on and so forth that this wheat this european wheat we talk about actually from america and you know the oldest maize and corn is from america as well and they find corn you know with mummies in the nile you know i think we're dealing with similar cultures just separated by many many a long distance so yeah, I wanted to include that. Somehow I left that out of the the transition period here. But um, I guess we'll talk some more about petrifactions. Um, yeah, we'll talk some more about petrifactions. This one is really weird. And we'll, we'll find throughout more mounds, especially in the Mississippi Valley, that, that, that you're going to find more stuff like this. The Colorado Stone Giant. The petrified man or Colorado Stone Giant is now on exhibition in New York and is claimed to be the specimen of an extinct race of prehistoric men who formerly peopled America. The figure is seven and a half feet long and of 600 pounds weight. The features are of decided Indian type, high cheekbones, low retreating forehead, and an enormous posterior cranium. The right arm is bent and hand lying upon the breast, the bones between the wrist and fingers and the fingers and the bones with their procession are said to be true in nature. The left arm rests on the left leg, which is drawn up and the flexor muscle bears a scar. The great toes on the feet have the appearance of thumbs and are not unlike the toes of a gorilla. But that which excites the greatest curiosity among scientific men is the vertebrae, which is extended about two in two inches and a half, displaying a well-defined tail. This tail is not believed to be the oscets projected by the shrinkage. I can't pronounce what that little bone is. By the shrinkage of muscles, for in that case, it would have a flat arrow-shaped form. It is about five inches long, round, about one inch in diameter, and with a conical termination. On Friday evening, a large gathering of scientific men, among who were professors from Ogden, Charles A. Dormus, Hamilton, Klamer, Bamstead, Post, Mott, Smith, and scores of other eminents in science and medicine, blah, 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 holy smokes, lots of people, visited the aquarium and made a close and careful examination of the petrifaction. The stone man should be brought to the city and submitted to the scrutiny of our medical experts that whom no better are to be found in this country. So yeah, seven and a half foot tall skeleton with ape-like toes and a tail. Now, if you've 
you know, if you followed my Twitter over the years, I've found all kinds of insane skeletons, skeletons with wings, skeletons with horns. I found several skeletons with tails. Um, and believe it or not, this isn't the first ape like um, um, skeleton. I found actually quite a few in the Mississippi Valley. Very strange. Their bones are incredibly thick. Their skulls are like, you know, an inch thick. Um, very, very strong looking bones. Um, and a very strange sloping forehead. Large brow, sloping forehead. Very ape-like. You know, maybe man wasn't descended from ape, but maybe there was a whole other genesis. You know, like I reference all the time, Lord of the Rings. And, um, yeah, truth is stranger than fiction. And perhaps the world, again, we've been talking about the vapor canopy and the world of giant trees. And perhaps there were many, many different forms of life. And it seems plausible to me. Um, we're going to hop into this one. Is this Baron Nordenskold? A report that he has been arrested in Colorado for despoiling cliff, cliff dwellings. Denver, September 18th. For years past, thousands of tourists and deer hunters have visited those portions of Colorado where there are ancient cliff ruins. While there are many ruins in New Mexico, the most interesting are on the Ute Indian Reservation near Ignacio, Colorado. This was the place selected by Baron Nordenskold of Stockholm, Sweden, to pass a few weeks and send to his native countrymen of color some Colorado novelties. A dispatch received here tonight from Durango says, Baron they're just going to, I'm messing this guy's name up. So we're just going to, the Baron of Stockholm was arrested last night by deputy United States Marshal Sergeant charged with robbing the cliff dwellings of the Ute Indian reservation of relics. The information was furnished by agent Bartholomew. We're going to go into this guy. This is no small dude. This guy had circumnavigated um, all of Europe, Africa, he was. He had been the. He had led an expedition into the 80th parallel, 80, 82nd degree, I think, which is no easy thing. Unbelievable. Um, his boat got stuck in the ice, and he had to live on his boat for like eight months. I mean, insane. The Baron came from Sweden about six weeks ago and obtained permission to go on the reservation to explore the ruins of the cliff dwellers but with the understanding that he was not to molest or remove anything. Contrary to this, it seems, he fitted out a party of eight men and went at once to digging and tearing down these ancient ruins, gathering an immense amount of relics of pottery, skeletons, mummies, mummies, not skeletons, I'd say mummies, and implements. Because... And we're going to read another article, which I'll try to remember to do next, about uh, them tearing down these buildings, stealing mummies, and shipping them to Europe. Tearing down these ancient ruins, gathering an immense amount of relics of pottery, skeletons, and implements, boxing them up and shipping them by express to New York, where they were to be shipped to Stockholm. The Baron is held awaiting the action of the proper authorities. If this is Baron, the fact of his presence in this country has been kept remarkably quiet. He received one of the grand prizes at the Bern Geographical Congress a few weeks ago for his facsimile atlas of ancient maps. I was able to find this. Um, unbelievable. Okay, listen, this guy was given an award because he put together this um, a book, essentially, for the Geographical Society of all these different ancient maps from all over the world. And, you know, in this community, you know, old maps are really appreciated and you can find a lot of really amazing things. Now imagine this guy's a Baron. Uh, he was the Baron of Finland, but then he became the Baron of Sweden. Can you imagine the kind of things, the kind of maps he got his hands on? That we, you know, we have no idea even exist. Um, 
And remember, this guy was sailing all around the globe. Now, what would drive a Finn? Now, we've been talking again about the Phoenicians, um, Moorish, um, Moorish culture in America. We've been talking about um, Mecca, you know, all these biblical overlays, you know, where the Phoenicians helped Solomon build his temple. Well, you know, it's seeming more likely that was here. And, um, you know, we've talked about the overlays between the Finns and, and some of these cultures here, you know, the swastika being one of them, these ancient symbols, you know, the, the Phoenician priests, that's what was all over their clothing. Um, and you find and the oldest swastikas exist in this part of the, the region. Now you got this guy who's been given all these awards and he's, secretly come into the country as he said his presence has been kept remarkably quiet and he's boxing up pottery skeletons and implements and shipping them back home this was happening a lot this was happening a lot here in america and um yeah he wasn't the only one i guarantee you that um let's get um one of my favorites we're going to jump into this one here um Hmm. Give me one second. For some reason, my thread left out two or three of my favorite ones here. So I'm just pulling them up real quick. This one's a long one, so bear with me, okay? And we're going to get through probably two or three more after this, and then uh, and then I'll try to do uh, kind of talk to you guys a little bit more. Um, again, I apologize for being so absent with the chat. Um, you know, like I was saying, trying to condense these down is really counterintuitive to the whole thing because this is, you know, we've, we're only really scratching the surface of what Colorado has to offer. Um, but throughout the week, I hope to continue to post some of the things I left out and just post them in small little digestible formats. And yeah, so you can kind of continue and follow along. And um, like I said, follow me on Twitter if you don't, because you're you're going to be able to read these at your own leisure and, and um, you know, look, look into them on your own, blah, blah, blah. So this is a longer one, but it's one of my favorites. So bear with me. Here we go. A Colorado yarn. The Leadville Chronicle publishes an account of the most marvelous discovery yet made by mortal man, provided that it is true, which is more than doubtful. Two miners, while sinking a shaft near Red Cliff, are represented to have found a deep subterranean chamber without apparent communication with the open air. Want they claim to have seen is thus described. The cave at first seemed empty. But as their eyes gradually became accustomed to the deep gloom, the men saw in the further extremity a huge black object, which not without some trepidation they approached. As they neared it, to their unbounded amazement, they made out the lines of some sort of sailing craft. It was, as nearly as they could judge, about 60 feet long and some 30 feet wide and lay tilted forward at an angle of about 15 degrees over a rough pile of stone. The body of the craft was built of short lengths of some dark and very porous wood, resembling our black walnut. If it could be imagined with the grain pulled apart like a sponge or a piece of bread, and made perfectly square, both ends were turned abruptly up like the toe of a peaked Moorish slipper. The planking, now Phoenician and Viking ships are identical, okay? Both ends turned abruptly up like the toe, okay? This is that turned up toe curved ends. This is Viking, Phoenician, and Moorish. The planking was apparently double riveted, with nails of extremely hard copper, only slightly rust-eaten, and with the heads cut or filed in an octagonal shape. Octagonal 
nails. <laughs> Crazy. While along the upper edge of the ship, 11 large rings of the same metal and evidently for the securing of the rigging were counted. At the bottom, the, at the bottom edges of the craft and running its entire length were two keels, some four and a half feet deep and six inches thick, hung on metallic hinges, and at the ends were fastened rough copper rods extending upward and bent over so as to attach to two masts rising from the upper edges. If the cross of an inverted V be conceived to represent the deck lines, the two stems are at about the angle and position of the masts. These were upward of 20 feet long and has evidence that a sail was at one time stretched across some ragged remnants of what appeared to be cording were found clinging to the inner edges. The ends of the mast were secured in pivots, and it was evident that in tacking, one could be moved forward and the other back, thus bringing the sail at an angle with the body of the ship, an idea which it may not be bad for our modern navigation, navigators to imitate. So we're dealing with a sailing vessel, Moorish, Viking, Phoenician ship, 60 feet below ground in Colorado. Okay, that's what we're dealing with here. And with sailing um, technology that is more advanced than what we're using today. This, it is believed, also explains the copper rods which moved the keels so as to reciprocate the position of the masts. So I, I love sailing. I've been sailing my whole life. Uh, when you understand that you can use these rods to move the keel as well as the ability to change the forward and aft position of your sails um, with tacking this is going to allow you to keep you know several knots into the wind pretty advanced while the whole ship was intact the wood crumbled like dust beneath the finger touch and fearful of trap falls the two prospectors did not venture to explore the interior Lying on the ground nearby, however, was discovered a gold instrument bearing a rude resemblance to the sextant of the present day, and possibly used to calculate their longitude. No trace of any writing was found, save at one end of the ship, important part here, where about midway on the bow of the ship, enclosed in a metal ring, were 26 copper characters riveted to the wood bearing much resemblance to the chinese hieroglyphics of the present day now remember chinese was changed okay chinese was changed and became an amalg amalgamation of of many languages so in the 1800s chinese was different than it is now and Again, if you've seen some of my other material, you'll see that they find, quote, Chinese hieroglyphics, which are actually proto-Phoenician and even very similar to block Hebrew all over America. And they find it on the pyramids in Mexico. No human remains of any sort were found, although it is possible that a search in the hold will reveal something of this sort. Without pushing their investigation further, the two miners, lost in wonderment, retraced their steps to the upper air, leaving the ghastly ship once more in gloom and silence. By this time, it had grown quite dark above, and with the tacit understanding existing among men who had seen that the witch borders upon the supernatural, they spoke but little between themselves of the discovery, but sought rest by their kindling campfire. In the morning, the whole thing seemed to be much like a dream, that they were seriously inclined to regard it as some morbid fantasy, some dis disordered vision of the brain, and having no substance in reality. They descended the rope again. In fact, they learned the night before the prospectors hurriedly ascended the shaft and spent the rest of the day in concealing. So they covered up everything. The entrance, their rope, all the stuff. And 
The gentleman is perfectly reliable and together with a well-known mining expert resisting in the city, residing, sorry, has seen and examined the ship and will take steps to preserve the wonderful discovery to the world and all its possibly great historical value. The minute particulars are, t- are as to the locality are present withheld for very obvious reals, reasons. They would attract a horde of vandal sightseers who would soon destroy the moldering dust beyond hope of rest- restoration. And until the proper authorities can be sent for, they will not be published. The discovery of the junk-like ship with its unknown architecture hermetically sealed in a cavern 15 feet below the surface of the earth gives scope to indefinite speculation. The only impl- the only possible explanation seems, however, that ages or eons, perhaps a gone, a vessel bearing a crew of bold discoverers tossed by the waves sought a harbor in a cave within a cliff. The waves then receding left it stranded there, and the great continental divide, the awful upheavals and convulsions of nature, which we know so little of and can only blindly speculate on, pressed the face of the earth together and sealed it in a living grave. I just love that. We've talked about, you know, the lava flows, you know, the Rocky Mountains, you know, the the story of the Rocky Mountains being created overnight. And, you know, that perhaps Colorado was once covered by a large inland sea. Seems quite plausible when you have something like that lying underground. Um, from there, what was the one I wanted to touch on? This is what we wanted to talk about. So, yeah, 150 people in chat. We're an hour and 22 minutes in. Uh, that was a long one, um, but one of my favorites, right? Now, so we're dealing with a Phoenician Viking style Moorish slipper. Buried 50, 60 feet below ground, uh, covered in Chinese hieroglyphics. And what was the world like, you know, uh, before these cataclysms? Interesting to ponder. How could a ship get put there? You know, it's kind of similar story to what we were talking about with the California Red Sea and the um, the Dead Sea of, of Salt Lake being connected with the ocean at one point. And yeah, that's 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 where I'm at. You know, how else would the ship have gotten there? Um, since we're talking about the convulsions of Earth and the, the possibilities of an ocean in Colorado, how would this ship get there? This is the next article we're going to jump to, and then we'll go to some disposing of ruins. We'll talk a little bit about radium before the end. Wonderful petrifactions in Colorado. On Friday last, we received a call from Mr. L. Allen, an elder, elderly gentleman from Rochester, New York, who came to Colorado about a year ago. By the advice of physicians, Mr. Allen was instructed to keep in the open air as much as possible, so has traveled extensively through southern Colorado. So it's kind of interesting. The advice of physicians, again, people were coming to Colorado because the air was he had healing properties. Southern Colorado, prospecting and viewing the country. He gave us the particulars of a strange discovery he made on one of his tramps, but declined to give the exact locality, mentioning only that it was some distance from Pueblo. At the place mentioned, several large mounds or foothills appear. Now, again, we were talking about what are mounds. They're always buried structures. Not always, but mostly. Rising from the plains and situated some distance from the mountains, Mr. Allen visited these in the first thing particular he noticed was what appeared to be petrified coconut. It was much larger than ordinary fruit, giant coconuts, okay? Coconuts in Colorado. The three eyes of the coconut were plainly to be seen. On breaking open the strange stone or petrifaction, the shell appeared perfect, being some half inch in thickness, and the inside was composed of white crystal quartz. Mr. Allen, think about that, you guys. Think about breaking open this, picking up this stone coconut, cracking it open, and the inside's all quartz crystal. 
Mr. Allen continued his investigations and discovered a number of other specimens similar to the first. Also, other resembling other kinds of fruits. This just takes us back, if you remember, to um, um, Alaska. Remember, Alaska was tropical, and they found all kinds of fruit in Alaska, petrified fruit, all kinds. Here we are, the same thing. We're finding coconuts and petrified fruits at, you know, a mile above sea level in Colorado. Specimens of petrified wood in large quantities were also found. The mounds or hills appeared to be made up of loose, sandy soil, and shells were found in great variety and quantity. The strangest part of the discovery, however, was yet to come. In digging into the side of the hill, Mr. Allen unearthed what seemed to be a perfectly petrified sea turtle. And before closing his investigations, about a dozen of these were discovered, a dozen petrified sea turtles. He described them to us as being almost perfect, and no doubt appears to remain in his mind, but that they are genuine petrifactions of sea turtles, such as are found in the Pacific. From the numerous specimens of shells that are found at various places on the plains and numerous and numbers of which are found in this neighborhood, many persons are led to believe that the great plains on which we live were at one time the bed of an immense ocean, and this discovery tends to confirm that theory. We learn that several gentlemen of this city, to whom Mr. Allen had disclosed his discovery, propose accompanying him in a wagon to the scene of his explorations and bringing with them some of the newfound curiosity. Worlds in collision. Yeah, we're dealing with a tropical ocean that was brought to a mile above sea level in an instant. Okay. And what do we keep coming back to here in Colorado? Petrifaction after petrifaction after petrifaction. And when you look at the Garden of the Gods, and I, you know, I hope you guys go and look at it on your own. You know, I only showed four pictures you can find. Yeah, Jay Jamer's theories. I love, you know, me and him are on a very similar um, pathway. We agree on a lot of things. Um, the evidences for a plasma event are pretty undeniable, especially here in the Southwest. And, you know, I think Jay lives in Colorado. Uh, Tacoma here in chat. Yeah, so Tacoma, go back if you haven't seen my Washington video. Unbelievable. Um, right there in Tacoma, below a 1,000 feet of lava flow, they found a beach. They were digging a well and found a beach 1,000 feet below ground level in Tacoma. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to touch on that one since we covered the ship how would the ship get there well <laughs> probably during some insane um earthquake um type of event um the shifting of the earth in an instant led to that um i kind of got a creepy one i want to talk about but it's really cool. It's one of my favorites I've ever found. It's a little bit off subject, but who cares? Colorado's monster spiders. Scientific investigation of insects of which many yarns were told. Professor E.T. Lawton has returned to his home in New York after spending the winter and exploring the mountains near Buena Vista and, and investigating the habits of the species of monster spiders found in the Middle Cottonwood Pass. <clears throat> Little definite is known of these spiders, but around them has been gathered a massive legend and prospectors' yarns that rival those of Munchausen. Many years ago, these spiders lived in a cave easily reached by tourists. It was in a valley two miles east from Harvard City, then a thriving mining camp eight miles west from Buena Vista. In 1880, a man named Schultz cut his way into the spider's den. He did not return a week later, 
A searching party found his body partly buried in the spider's cave under a mass of fallen rocks. As it would have required considerable timbering at an expense of several hundred dollars to recover the body, and as the man had no known relatives, it was left undisturbed. Schultz's skeleton is still in the cave, but the, the spiders have found another home farther back in the mountains. Some of the tales told about these spiders are given in an old letter, which has just been found in Buena Vista. It says, A short distance out of Buena Vista, there is a cave swarming with spiders of immense size, some of them having legs four inches long, the bodies as big as that of a canary. The cave was discovered in 1888 and was uh, often visited by pioneers on their way to California who obtained their webs for use in place of thread. Early and late, the cave resounds with a buzzing sound emitted by the spiders as they weave their webs. The webs were, t- were tested in 71 and found to be composed of silk of the finest quality. The skins of the spiders make good gloves as they are pliable and require no tanning. That's creepy, huh? This is my favorite part here, guys. A number were captured and tamed and manifested great affection for all members of the family. They were far superior to a cat in exterminating rats and mice, following their prey into the holes in the walls and the ceilings. One spider, kept as a pet by a Buena Vista lady, used to stay all night at the head of her bed, acting as a sentinel. Training giant spiders, okay? Hunting mice and rats. Can you imagine? Now, I know that's yucky to some people, but you know, as a reptile lover, and I have had a few tarantulas in my day. um, Spiders are, quote, very smart, and they are quite affectionate. And I just love that. I think it's crazy. Crazy, wild story, you know. Try to, you know, I cover so much, like, antiquity ruined stuff. It's fun to come across kind of a different tone and a wild story, and it's pretty fun. So I just like that one a lot. Uh, we'll cover a petrifaction. We'll do Pike's Peak. Then we'll do um, man, did I not post dismantling ruins? How annoying was that of me to do? There's one where the Smithsonian was talking about people tearing ruins apart and sending mummies overseas. And somehow I didn't include that. That's really annoying of me. How's everybody doing? An hour and 33 minutes in. Uh, We're going to go 12 more minutes. We're going to go all the way to seven. So that's a lot to work in here. Let's do it. Interesting fossils. DC, 1876. We're back in the gardens of the gods, people. And this is really going to put a lot more emphasis on what we were talking about earlier. Professor J.H. Kerr, who was the professor of chemistry and geology, Colorado College, had the honor on the 13th of December of unearthing some of the most remarkable fossils near the foot of Pikes Peak in a public resort known as the Garden of the Gods. The chief was a reptile, 117 feet long. A part of it exposed to the rain and frost had crumbled, but the remainder consists of bones of petrified casts in a well-preserved condition. About 4,000 pounds of these and several hundred pounds of bones have already been removed. In connection with these gigantic remains were petrified portions of other animals, one of them being eight or 10 feet long, whose position would seem to indicate that they had gone into the stomach of the hundred foot monster. The professor, now I have a really interesting one of these that we'll get to further down this series of, um, they found a petrified 
um, person inside of a giant alligator, <clears throat> 30 foot alligator. The professor also has unearthed about 50 specimens, species, I'm sorry, 50 species of petrified nuts, comprising among them the hickory nut, the butternut, the pecan, a variety of Brazil nuts, and the almond. Again, we're talking with tropical, a tropical setting here. One, which seems to belong to the Brazil nut family, is considerably larger than a pint cup. One which seems to belong to the Brazil nut family is considerably larger than a pint cup. Okay, you, you hear what I'm saying, guys? A pint cup seed. So how big are these trees? Well, their seeds are as big as a pine cup, larger than a pint cup. Larger than a pine cup. These seeds are huge. They're bigger than the fruit. Think about how big the fruit would be. Holy shit. These, as well as the animal fossils, would seem to point to a much milder climate, yes, tropical, like the entire world, than even the most enthusiastic admirers of Colorado can claim for it now. Yeah. Whoa. Crazy. 117-foot-long monster with a 10-foot-long creature in the stomach and petrified nuts and seeds as big as a pine cup. Holy shit, yeah. The pine cone holding something like that would be, a, it would break your head. <laughs> that would kill you if that fell on you. <clears throat> yeah, I need a hard hat under that. A hard hat wouldn't do it. You just don't, you just don't be under that thing. It's crazy. Uh, I really wanted to find the tearing the ruins down. I'll just do a short video on it and post that later this week since I don't know why I didn't include it in here. Uh, yeah, I've been a little bit behind the ball. I want to get other series going. You know, I don't want to get to, uh, I just don't want to do Anomalous America only. There's so many other things that interest me. So like I was mentioning at the beginning of this video, you know, I might just um, do two states a month and start working on some of my other things. Because I want to do a book series where I um, kind of audio book chapters and then discuss the chapters. Um, I want to do a poetry series because, you know, I love, I love poetry and I want to share some of that with you guys. Those would be really short, you know, one, two, five minute long videos. Um, and then do, you know, offshoots like the, the, the radium series and, you know, all these other ones, you know, subterranean realms and blah, 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 blah. But yeah, we got to read this Pike's Peak one. It's really amazing. Here's what Pike's Peak looked like in the 1800s. Beautiful place. If we cannot have the Platte River Canal, there still remains the chance for extracting electrical energy from the upper atmosphere by building an artificial mountain. Say what? An expert electrical engineer who has just returned to Chicago after inspection of Pike's Peak. Huh? Remember, Pike's Peak, where we just found all the petrified remains right next to Garden of the Gods proposes to locate a basic station on that mountain for tapping the clouds to secure electricity. Now, Pikes Peak, people have hypothesized that its, its structure is incredibly odd and that nature doesn't build things like Pikes Peak and that it seems to be shaped by the hands of man. And when you look at the crystalline structure of Pikes Peak, it's incredibly strange. Um, it's like, it has no, it's like, it's like negatively charged. It has like no mag magnetism to it. Pikes Peak is a weird place. According to this electrical engineer, it is only a question of time when Colorado will be supplied with power extracted from the upper atmosphere through the projection of magnets thrown from the earth. This scheme evidently proceeds upon the theory that the atmosphere above the clouds is the reservoir of electricity which is true. 
Again, we're talking about plasma electrical discharge on a massive scale, right? Lightning and, and all these things are are tiny little um, um, exchanges between the Earth and the upper um, ether, the upper atmosphere. Imagine an event where all of that energy would be disposed on one area. And that's what happened here in the Southwest. But some of the most eminent scientists believe that the Earth is the reservoir of all electrical energy. It's it's a dual. It's dualistic. Um, with all magnetism, you have a positive and a negative, and you have to have an exchange to have the weather patterns we do. It's 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 very much uh, evident there is a magnetic force involved. You study cloud systems, um, lightning discharge, how thunder works, the creation of tornadoes and hurricanes. You'll see that ether physics and magnetism are the only things that explain it. Blah, 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 generated by the revolution around its own axis. While the atmosphere above the clouds is electrified by electricity drawn from the earth, instead of tapping the clouds for electrical currents with which a, to propel machinery, it may, be, it may be eventually prove more economical and practical to draw the power directly from the earth. Well, it's both. And they were doing both geothermal, um, you know, galvanic exchange, atmospheric. It's everything. You tap them all to be the most efficient, of course. Uh, where did we want to finish? Did we want to finish with some radium stuff? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I, oh, this one's really good too. All right, we got to do this one. Chained in a cavern to die. PA 1890. Remarkable evidence of a prehistoric race found in Colorado. In the mountains near Colorado Springs, Colorado, two young men have discovered a remarkable cavern. Not knowing the extent of the cavern or whither its passages might lead them, they first fastened to the end of a ball of strong cord at the entrance of the corridor to be unwound and carried along as they proceeded on the way. The floor was the corridor was a solid rock and covered with the dust of centuries. It was wide enough for two to walk abreast with a decline of about one foot in 10 perfectly hewn cut channel like, like Giza essentially, you know, like a nice hallway. It ended in a large oblong chamber where the most brilliant stalactites depended. I bet that meant descended, but. While from the floor arose a number of huge stalagmites, ranging from 8 to 14 feet high and as wide as the virgin snow. The walls also reflected back to light like burnished silver. They found this chamber to be nearly 100 feet in length and about 70 in width, and as near as they could guess, 25 feet high. Lying close to the base of the pyramid, okay, in the middle of the room, was a pyramid. Lying close to the base of the pyramid was the skeleton of what had once been a man of almost gigantic proportions. Around the waist was a heavy iron band securely riveted together and to this was fastened to end a brass chain of peculiar workmanship about six feet in length the remaining end firmly embedded in the solid base rock the skeleton was in an excellent state of preservation on the opposite side of the pyramid another skeleton of smaller proportions Evidently that of a female was found chained in the same manner. At the foot of the pyramid, in the middle of one side, a small spring of ice-cold water bubbled up, discharging its sulfurous through a niche into a crevice in the floor. The victims had evidently been chained within sight and hearing of the rippling water, but out of reach and left to die by starvation or thirst or both. 
So a cave with obvious construction qualities, uh, a hallway that descended at the same degree, uh, hewn perfectly square, two people abreast could walk down it into a square room, a um, hundred feet by 70 feet with a stone pyramid in the middle and two skeletons, one of a gigantic stature, chained with brass to the pyramid, listening to running water, just like a little torture chamber, water and bubbling up. Horrible way to die. Yeah. Um, not exactly how I wanted to end the episode, but here we are, hour and 45 minutes in, 7 a.m., 10 a.m. Eastern. Really grateful you guys joined me for these early episodes. It really means a lot. Um, you know, and baseball season has started and I've got two boy, two boys playing baseball and that's, you know, two games a week, three practices. It's insane. Struggling a lot to find time to get all this stuff out to you guys. So your time is incredibly appreciated. And I hope you're still enjoying this series. Here we are seven episodes in. And um, yeah, the channel is doing fantastic. Uh, last week, we broke the 4K mark. And like I, like I said, uh, when I started this, you know, it's only two months. It's only my first two months in. My goal is to break 4K in April, the fourth month. Here we are in the fifth month. And my goal is to break into 5K before the end of the month. Um, so it's a lot of hard work. You know, I never thought it would be this much work, to be honest. Just uh, catalog cataloging everything and reorganizing all these articles and finding them all again. You know, when I first started saving all these things, it was for me, and I never, there was no interest in uh, <laughs> organizing it, um, you know, and uh, hindsight, as they say, you know, can be a bit of a, a pain in the ass, but it's all worth it, and um, eventually I'll have um, a Discord available um, where all this will be organized by state and by topic and and yeah, and they'll be uh, accessible to, to more people in that manner. And um, I appreciate every one of you that's joined me for these shows. And yeah, like I said, I'm going to skip the vote and we're going to do <clears throat> New Mexico next week. Finish off the four corners. Um, and then we'll we'll post a vote for Nevada or Idaho and go from there. I'm kind of tempted to keep going towards the Gulf. Um, so I don't really know what I'm going to do yet, but I feel bad leaving Nevada in the dust because there's just so much to cover there, but every state has a hidden history that's quite remarkable. So they're all worthy of an episode, but yeah, um, look forward to the rest of the week. I'm going to make little shorts as I find time to do so and share a bunch of the articles that we didn't even get to, which, um, are, there's a lot. I have three full page articles I wanted to get to. One is called, Is Life Worth Living? Oration Delivered Before the Juanita Society at Juanita Hot Radium Springs, Juanita Springs, Colorado. This is about the Juanita Hot Radium Springs in Colorado. It's a lengthy article, it's full page. I'll probably do a short video on that. Um, I have a full length, The Antiquities of Colorado, um, large read. Uh, from 1874. I'll make a short video on that one as well. And then what was my third one? My third article was about the lava flows, the extensive lava flows of Colorado. Um, and we'll try to get into that too. So again, thanks everybody for joining me. Um, don't forget to follow my um, Twitter page for updates. Um, every week leading up to the state, I post these articles you see here. So you can kind of get a, uh, um, a first look at what I'm going to be discussing before the videos come out on Tuesday. Um, and yeah, so thank you again, everybody. Make sure to uh, leave a comment or a question or anything you have to say in the comments after this goes up. And um, thank you all so much for being here and stay tuned. For more articles throughout the week. And um, the Radium show is a go. Everyone really, really seemed super pumped on it. So my goal is to do a, to have the video, first video out on Friday. 
Um, my son has a double header on Thursday. I have another one on Friday. So is that realistic? Probably not, <laughs> but I'm going to try. So stay tuned. Love you guys. Thanks so much for tuning in and take care of yourselves. Have a wonderful day. Happy May. Bye guys.